Hi, I'm Christian. And I'm Vera. And in this episode, we want to go through the basic steps how to diagnose a problem with your discovery. Hope you enjoy the video. I have two bings now when I start the car. One that's always there and another one because my washer fluid is empty. The reason we're filming was another one. And he just told me to start talking. In this episode, I want to talk about how to deal with a problem on your Discovery 3 or Discovery 4. So there should be only one Bing now. <laughs> As a hobby YouTuber providing Land Rover content, the major task Vera and I fulfill is that we are psychologists. Is that the right word? Yeah. Our role is to deal with Land Rover issues all over the planet around the clock. This yeah. is really the main work we do. Next to that, we provide a video every Sunday morning. And next to that, I go to work on a full-time job in the automotive industry. But that's all harmless compared to being a psychologist, okay? Sometimes I'm feeling like I'm the chief doctor in a hospital, actually, what's heißt in Ehrenanstalt? Oh. In a mental. Yeah. Hey, what? What's going on? Where are my shoes? So I... being <laughs> a YouTube hobby psychologist for Land Rover owners, um, I basically get contacted from people all over the planet with all their little problems. Mainly, my Land Rover isn't working anymore. I typically read the problem diagnosis. Um, the latest one I got is from Richard out of Laos. Okay, Richard, hello. I don't know why you bought a Land Rover Discovery in Laos, but don't worry about it. I'll help you fix it. And Richard's problem is that the car just revs up on its own to 4,000 RPM without any warning, which is in Laos apparently quite dangerous. The wheel charge still the same. The RPM is too high. Okay, because he wrote me that the average speed is there 30 kilometers per hour. So I had to go back and give him a couple of hints. And I start by telling, okay, what car do you have? Okay, because there are various Land Rover discoveries around and they all are different. And by far, I'm not an expert on those. I don't know all of them, okay? I'm not an expert on gasoline engines. I know a little bit about diesel engines because I'm only a hobby YouTuber, not a professional automotive technician. Everything you see us do on our channel in regard to our Land Rover is something where we practice learning by doing and then we make it look like in the video that we actually know what we're doing. Kind of get it? Okay. But still, we love to help people because I think one of the greatest things on about Land Rovers is the community around it, which is, by the way, completely different from the Toyota community, okay? The Toyota community is more like, okay, who has the best car and whose doesn't break? Versus Land Rover is like, oh, geez, mine is broken. Who can help me to <laughs> get it fixed? Yeah. Okay, so Vera is behind the camera again. And she's wearing a mask, okay? <laughs> I kind of find it hilarious that you have to actually wear a mask by law in Germany when you get gas. This is for my lawnmower. Yeah. Oh, a Golf 1, better known as a Golf Rapid. Oh wow, that's actually cheap today. It's 210 for a liter. Uh, yeah, but it's super E10. With gasoline, it's really amazing. If gasoline increases in price, it only takes a week until you accept this price and then you already talk about, wow, the gas is cheap today, we're getting gas. <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago before the war, we are allowed to say the war in the Ukraine is causing these high gas prices. We don't have to refer to it as a military operation. Um, so since the war in the Ukraine is going on, the gas price nearly doubled. How quickly the price 
becomes a new standard. Think about how easy it would be to, to make something a new standard in the bedroom. <laughs> And there is my lesson number one to all of you. You have to know exactly, and Richard does know, what car do you drive. You need to know, of course, the build year. And you need your kilometers. You need something about the maintenance record. You need to know your engine in detail. You need to know if it's the EU3, the EU4, or the EU5, or even 6 version. This is important because they are all different. You need to know the VIN number and you need to know the amount of horsepower. So that is the first rule of thumb. Know what car you got. If I call you in the middle of the night and I wake you, okay, and I want to know what plate year you have, how many kilometers are on there, what engine it is, you got to, you know, just in your sleep, wake up and tell me exactly what that is. Otherwise, sell your car. If you don't know anything about it, and there are certainly cars, like some Toyotas, you don't need to know anything about them. You can just drive them, okay? And if people ask you, hey, what car you got? Uh, I got that, what cruiser? I, I'm not so sure about it. No, what year? No, I don't know. I don't know what. But if you drive a Land Rover, you need to know a lot more. And you need to know that before you send Christian an email. <laughs> well, best is if you write part of that into the email, yeah. but don't overdo it, okay? Don't write down there, when your car had the last car wash and got the tires replaced, let's test what Vera knows about her oh, car. Shit. How often did we replace the left hand EGR valve on your car? The left hand? Yes, not the right hand. One. Left hand is this one oh, where I sit. Twice. Yes. And that one once. Very good. Yeah. Where are the flaps in your car? I don't know. <laughs> Sarah and June showed us the flaps on her Bronco. And I thought my car must have the same thing, but I can't. Find. I basically know where they are. They are behind. The viewers may not know what the flaps are, okay? <laughs> when you close your door, if your car wouldn't have any flaps, which is a check valve, if you will, which pushes the air out as a distinct point so your doors can close. Those are called, in my world, flaps. And they are located on the car somewhere, and Vera never found them. I'm that... not too cold, am I? <laughs> yeah, you, you, they are back there. Yeah. <laughs> but precisely where are they? Do you want to have another mean question to test her or a fair one? I'd say we go with a mean one. Where is the air filter for the air suspension compressor? I don't know. Mm. I don't need to know that. <laughs> okay. And I bet no other viewer knows that thing has an air filter, believe it yeah. or not. We'll check a few easy ones to see if she knows them. Okay. Horsepower? 190? Yes. Oh, good. Cylinders? Six. Type of engine? It's a diesel engine. And is it a inline or a? V. What PD is it? V6. Engine volume? 2.7. And the Discovery 4 I got? 3.0. What's the difference between between my Discovery 4 engine-wise and your Discovery 3? You've got two, two turbochargers. Correct. How many horsepower does mine have? 246 or 256. How many Newton meters does yours have? I have no idea. I don't do Newton meters. Which is not very important, but it's 404 Newton meters. You don't do Newton meters. <laughs> How do you not do Newton meters? <laughs> I don't know that stuff. Any I man mean does Newton meters. <laughs> Newton meters is the new standard. When did we change the serpentine belt last? We did not. There you go. Because <laughs> it's lying back there. How often did we change the fuel pump timing belt? How many times? Once. Once. Yes. Okay. How many times did we change the oil pump? Uh, twice now. How many times did we change the timing belt in the front? Once, last, twice. Okay, now a difficult one. Oh no. Which of the three components we never changed? Water pump, alternator, or servo pump? And we did not change the alternator yet, I know that. You have to make multiple checks. Oh, it's, like... it's multiple. Yeah. Oh, we did not change the water pump. <laughs> we did change the water pump. <laughs> yes, of course, it was on sale, remember? Ah, maybe that was before YouTube. No, it was. It's in a video. Every viewer knows that now. Oh shit! You're gonna cut that out. <laughs> no, no, I leave that in there. <laughs> we yeah. are talking about this car. Yes, of course. When did we do that? 
I have to show you the video. That's isn't that the line you tell people most often? You have to watch the video if you ask questions. I still okay. Don't believe you. And now it's already becoming more difficult, okay? I'm not going to give you the sugar coated version. You want to drive a Discovery 3 or a Discovery 4 and not a what cruiser. You need to have a diagnostics unit. Yes. Bottom yes. line, you buy this vehicle on day two, you buy a diagnostics unit. Without this unit, you can drive this car right over to the junkyard. Yeah. I even, even if it's brand new. I even tell people, those who email us asking what to look for in a discovery, I'm planning on buying one. I always say, get one, get a diagnostics tool before you test drive any discovery. Yes. You're going to get it anyway. But that's so. Ferris buying guide for a yeah. discovery, you call it. Yeah. Okay. Where's your diagnostics tool? Beneath that seat. So I got shopping bags. That one I got in the Pyrenees. Uh, we're looking for a diagnostics tool now, not for shopping bags. Very good. Okay, so why do you between scenes have to eat something? Because I'm always hungry. <laughs> so here I got my Alka soap. We also have the extension cord, but the extension yeah, cord I'll... does not work with a gap tool or diagnosing the FBH. So this one was when we originally bought it. 130 euros. This is the iCarsoft i930, which is an excellent little device for the Discovery 3 and Discovery 4. Of course, it can't do as much as the gap tool, but it's completely sufficient. And for about $160 to $180, you get the later versions yep. of this tool today, yep. and they are nicer, okay, yep. but they're not necessary. So if you can get a, a cheap one like this used, it does it. With this tool, you are able to read the fault messages. Now, it doesn't do the mechanic any good if you know what warning lights are on on the dash. They are always on, okay, one of them. And they always come on all together, combined with a couple of bings and bongs. So this is no good. This, yeah. this is no good information you get out of the dash. You connect it and you read your fault messages, okay? That was lesson number two fault messages not dash lights and bings and bongs and oh it's all dash lights are on what's the problem with my car you know send that over to christian show him a screenshot of the dash looks you, like a discovery <laughs> looks like a discovery it's the discovery dash not a toyota dash okay yeah. on a toyota dash the light bulbs might be broken in the meantime because they never been used I, i'm actually not sure if a toyota has a fault light I doubt it. I don't know. It has a check engine light. Why would the manufacturer install something what he doesn't need? The check engine light is probably just there. So you look if it's still there or if somebody stole it. <laughs> Lesson number three. How the basic use and interpretation of the faults works. Okay. You are on the Autobahn and you just drove 165 for about 40 kilometers full throttle with your rooftop tent on i'm trying to yeah construct a 160 with a rooftop yeah. tent yeah i'm trying to construct a case from fabian okay Bumble. and suddenly your engine just quits okay you have the automatic transmission the rpm goes to zero you turn your um, emergency light on and then you um, exit over to the right hand side stalling it on the autobahn what do you do next you have to get your safety triangle out. The law actually says you're not allowed to remain in the vehicle, so you have to deal with that on your own. But, you know, that could happen in Laos to you as well. So you, you know, stop on the side of the road in Laos where anybody drives 30 kilometers per hour anyhow, according to Richard. The next step is before you call a tow truck or before you call the AAA, you get your fault reader out and then you read your faults because it might be something you be able to fix. How do you diagnose a fault and what's important there? Don't worry, we're not going to go in through all the faults now and so on, but I want to give you some basic information. So here, Vera was referring to the extension cord and what the extension cord does, it brings this connector, which is here on your way of your clutch pedal to over here. This way, you can leave this unit in way easier and leave it connected at all times. You don't even have to put it away. And now you can see any cable is actually long enough yeah. to have it here in. comfortably. 
go get yourself this extension cord here. You can see that from Amazon. It's the flat cable type. You plug it in, you route it over here and done. But ours doesn't work with the Gap 2D. I have to plug it in here direct. It also does not work for the FBH diagnostics. The thing you need to know that there are nuisance faults. I think that's the correct name. A nuisance fault is a fault which is meaningless and you don't have to worry about it. How do you know what's a nuisance fault and what's a regular, a real fault? I don't know. Well, what's the way to find it out? You, you read them out while your car is running just fine. Now listen to that one. I did not coach her, okay? Because it's logical. Yeah. It's logical. You have to use this thing when your car is running, of course, and you have to learn about what faults are stored as long as your car is still healthy. You have to know the base condition of your car in a runnable situation. So just like Vera said, you read it while it's still working. Yeah. And you do that on a regular basis. So once you have this thing and your car is running, you play in with it. Put your cell phone away and play with this thing for a while. If you want to play with your cell phone, get the Gap 2D tool, then you can do both at once. <laughs> yeah. But it's more expensive. With this device, you read your faults once in a while and you also clear them. And you will see there are certain types of faults always coming back. And those are the nuisance faults. This is ECU so-and-so lost communication. That's normal. They could become serious. If you have a CAN bus problem, wiring issue, you know, some critter chewed the cable through, you will also find faults of real issues like blower, motor, flap, lower left foot well not working, whatever. Yeah, you don't even know that the thing isn't working. How, how would you know? So you will have then faults which are not so bad and you don't have to worry about them. But you need to know that they're already there. That's the lesson number three. Learn about your faults. So when you stalled on the side of the road and we'll construct Fabian's case um, and he reads out his fault messages, he got crankshaft positioning sensor unplausible signal. He knew that his crankshaft positioning sensor gives him a lot of problems a lot of times and it's always logging a fault. It's even causing sometimes a limp mode. My message is he knew that this is not making his engine fault out so it stalls. He knew about that because he was regularly checking his faults and then there was the second fault turbocharger boost pressure out of plausible range something like that and that's the message he sent me you know next to the pictures of his car on the side of the road and him wearing his safety vest and you know the, the entire story <laughs> like i said i am a psychologist i give him credit for being able to find this fault using his diagnostics unit and knowing that this is the unusual fault. If he would have not had any kind of experience with the faults he regularly got on his 2009, and trust me, there are a lot of those, um, he would have not been able to give me that diagnostics. And while I was lying on the couch, I could write him back where you need to look for a broken hose somewhere between your air filter and your turbocharger most likely it's not a sensor issue because it happened abruptly while he was driving 160 with the rooftop tent on <laughs> so the engine was under a high load and the boost pressure is high from the turbocharger so and he's using silicone hoses silicone hoses have the tendency to slip off they don't stick as good even if they last longer so I was able to give him that hint. Yep, found it. And he lights down in his engine compartment and there was the hose split off. That's why I say I'm a psychologist. And remember, we're doing that for all over the globe. And for free. Well, we also have fun doing it. I think you got that lesson. This thing is useless to you if you're not regularly investigating your vehicle visit. It's a Land Rover, okay? If this would be on a Toyota, you can leave it in the original packing. You can actually leave it in the Amazon store. It doesn't matter. We come to lesson number four. Look for the information online. Okay. Yeah. And there you have to understand how do you look for information online. You type in the Google search field, disco3.co.uk. And behind that, you write your fault description. 
you don't go to the Disco 3 website right away because their search tool sucks. Yeah. You t use the Google search tool to find it on their website. So if you enter disco3.co.uk, boost pressure not plausible. And then you get as first the, the listings from the Disco 3 website and you can go through them and click through them and read the articles and learn out of those articles how people refer to this problem. That's the most important thing. Is it the problem you're dealing with and how are they referring to it? And once you have a couple of notes, you go back to the Google search screen and you type in those notes, okay? You type in those keywords. I researched this problem and I try to learn about it. I try to understand it. Item number four, last working point. You need to know exactly what your last working point was with your car. Working point, I mean, when did it work last and under what circumstances? What happened since the fault or the problem occurred? This is really important. That's your last working point. If you don't have that little bit of basic history, let's call it short-term memory, okay? Um, it's going to be really difficult to find the problem. Last working point is not the ever since syndrome. Ever since is if you go back to your technician and you say, hey, ever since you worked on the car, it's doing this and that. Trust me, this is not going to be helping you if you do that to any kind of a technician. You have to understand when the car was working last and what was causing the new problem and did it really happen on its own. And in the very most cases, it didn't. It is caused by something. It could be as simple as I worked on my battery. Oh, didn't I run over that wild boar the other day? Maybe that knocked out my temperature sensor at the oil pan down there. Things like this. During that last water crossing, maybe it wasn't so good that the water was in the trunk. Hmm. Well, that noise I had when I hit the this huge curb and since then the power steering is kind of hung up. Let's check what kind of nuisance faults Vera's car got here, oh okay? This is a healthy Discovery 3, which is well-maintained and well-loved. Uh, I'm sorry for the greenhouse terrorists, but I'm gonna let the engine run for a moment while we do this diagnosis. Planet dies a day earlier, that's on me. Choose the diagnostics menu, it's very simple. Then I choose Land Rover, okay? That's the problem child. And then here, Discovery, very simple, Discovery 3 and then the diesel V6, and I go manual select, and then I get a list of all the ECUs. If I have them or if I don't have them, doesn't matter. First one is engine control module. I go in, okay, and then I say read DTCs, read. And I got one, control module communication bus off. This is a typical nuisance fault. That fault can occur at any time when you start the vehicle. Okay, yeah, it has that, but then you clear it. Okay. Okay. So now let's go instrument cluster. That's an interesting one because that locks all the faults which are displayed in the instrument cluster. And there we got six faults. Wow. So we got lost communication with engine control module. We already learned about that. Hit the arrow key to get the next fault. And another lost communication with transfer case. Third one, same thing. Fourth one. With audio unit, yep, same thing. And here is a good <gasps> one. Oh my God. We got fuel sensor one circuit. What does that mean? When did you have the fuel sensor one circuit fault? It's been a while, but I remember it. What happens if you have that fault? Yeah, we did something probably. No. Okay, I tell you. Remember when your fuel gauge dropped to zero when it was really cold? That oh, yeah, day, but that was wild and the enough. and the fuel light came on. Yes, that was your fuel sensor yes. failing, and then you drove around, and suddenly it popped back up, and it was all healthy again. I don't know if your discovery does that too, but when it gets cold, sometimes it loses. Yeah, it loses connection to the fuel sensor because yes. you're driving on the autobahn when yeah. your fuel gauge drops. Yeah, to so and that locks also nowhere. this fault. Not a problem, not to be worried about, but important to know that this happens. Yeah. And I will not fix this unless it's becoming a real yeah, issue. 
Yeah, okay. you can get a heart attack because of yeah. the fault lag. And now I go fault six. Battery disconnection electronic control unit reset. So what happened there? You wired red to, <laughs> I want to, to black you. and plus to minus. Okay, <laughs> this, this fault is apparently caused by our last video. Red is black and plus is minus. And you drilled a hole into the terminal. <laughs> yeah, I hope you guys watched that video. By knowing my faults and knowing the history of my car, exactly. it gives me a good clue on which faults are serious yeah. and which faults are not serious. That's what I'm talking about, okay? The last functioning or working point. I turned the car off so that, so that the greenhouse terrorists don't get all paranoid. So now I would go through this um, on all ECUs listed here in my iCarsoft tool. And I would do that, I don't know, maybe every month or so, but not every year. Every year is not often enough. If you do that regularly, you will not get surprised that your car has 15 faults when it breaks down. Item five, stick around when your discovery is fixed. This is important. Learn what is going on because you have information for that technician and not every technician is willing to work with you on the car but you know if you have it privately fixed or so by a friend and so on you gotta stick around don't drop this car off and let your friend or your mechanic do everything all alone because you have information what is valuable you will remember certain things while we work on the car okay for example Vera always remember where I keep my tools and try to be of assistance to the technician working on it, okay? Don't be in his way. And again, don't give him the ever since syndrome. Those are my suggestions, my basic steps. And if you do not have the willingness to do this, at least the Discovery 3 is the wrong car for you, yeah. unfortunately, okay? You should think about that what cruiser. And the Discovery 4 is even more complicated. Yes, so I didn't want to say it, yeah. but the Discovery 4 can it's also then be... way out of your league. Well, I don't want to say it like this. Yeah. Because yeah. the Discovery 4 could be much newer. Yeah, that's And true. it could have a lot less miles and also your wallet could be a lot bigger so <laughs> that you don't have to deal with any of that. I mean, we're discussing this stuff so you can drive this car on a relatively small budget. Yeah. I think that's the typical Discovery 3 driver. Yeah. Um, he wants to have or she wants to have a relatively good luxury and big SUV with a lot of capability, but not spending a ton of money for it. These cars are very, very cheap to get, but expensive to own if you have them serviced and maintained by Land Rover. But if you follow a little bit our videos and you follow these tips and hints, it is possible to drive them on a relatively small budget. And of course, you need to have some good luck, okay? So don't play the lottery every day because that's stressing your luck. <laughs> so I think we beat this topic to death. Don't say blah blah. We do that the correct oh, way. Okay, then I do it the correct <laughs> yes, way now. Yes. Okay. Don't do it. So if you like this video, please check out our other videos. Give it a thumbs up, like, subscribe, and share. And in any case, please don't unsubscribe. So that's it. In that video, that was a little bit more talking and less action. Um, I hope you still liked it. Hope to see you next Sunday. So we got our first patch. Christian designed it and it looks so cool. And it has the Velcro backing so it sticks to your roof liner. It's 9 centimeters wide and it doesn't have the mall crawler logo on it. It's the traditional LR Time logo design. Hope you guys like it. He makes me go slow. Are you putting leather stitches on Robin's on Robin's welding clothes? Yeah. That's a good idea because he burns holes into them. Well, everybody does. I'm thinking about sewing an entire leather jacket for him. 
I think I can do that. I think I need to buy you a better <laughs> sewing machine. Sewing machine. The one from Aldi is not really very good. Yeah. And just for those of you who think AEG is a German brand, it's no longer. The Chinese bought this name and they can put it on low cost products. Yeah. So this one was 80 euros. Yeah. So Robin is working on an eel out of steel. And uh, he's not quite finished here. You can see he's still a little bit of a construction site. But I think this is already looking beautiful. Is that the water gekühlt? Yeah, there is the pump. Oh, okay, so it's water cooled. Pulling right now 780 amps. Now that was quick. That was extremely quick. So two heats. Yes. So this is how a piece like this would be used. If you got, for example, a, a door like this, it has all these pieces in here and you just saw how this is made. Very impressive. So here Robin is making a, who knows what it is, a steel television. So this is what the mall crawler is good for, hauling goods. So we're really lucky today because I got gas for 2099, 47 meters for 99 euros. That's a bargain. And that time style. Oh my God, it's windy outside. So it's a Saturday morning before breakfast. Christian already fixed our chainsaw and balanced Philip's front wheel. I adjust the spokes because yeah. he wrecks them every day. These are already the most expensive components. Yeah. Are just not tough enough for the abuse. Mm -hmm. 